Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. program this afternoon and for those of you out in television of course it's just a continuation of what you saw yesterday or last week whatever the case may be but uh, we're just a simple Bible study and uh, I say simple but hopefully you'll take it beyond the simple level and study on your own and my it thrills our hearts when people write or call and say how they have gotten really excited about studying the scriptures because it is it's the most exciting book on earth but uh, as I've said before, see the scoffer, 99 times out of 10, a scoffer has never studied. And uh, he's just scoffing from, from, uh, from ignorance. Because anybody who really studies this can't help but understand that it's a supernaturally inspired word of God. All right, now we are now in book number 55. Iris wants me to remind you of that because it makes it so much easier when the girls answer the phone and you order something that you can just tell us, I want book number 55, which would be the compilation of 12 programs, the uh, three tapings of four programs each one. Okay, I think that's the announcements. All right, let's get right back where we left off in 2 Peter chapter 2. And uh, we left off in uh, verse 20, and I think we'll read it again. Jerry's got 21 on the board. But let's read the verse that we were commenting on when we almost ran out of time. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge... In other words, these false teachers have enough understanding. They're not, they're not totally rejecting everything. But after they've escaped the pollutions of the world, that is, the corruptions of it... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, that is, in their corruptive practices, and overcome, that is, by the corruption. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And we went back last taping, you remember, to Simon the sorcerer back in uh, the book of Acts, and how after Samaria received the gospel, he wanted that power as well. But he never became a true believer. Oh, he made all the outward appearances, because otherwise the guys wouldn't have baptized him. And he made a profession, but he never had a heart-born salvation. And consequently, he went in, and if we can uh, go a little bit about ancient church history, evidently Simon went on to become one of the biggest thorns in the side of the early church. He just became a complete adversary of the truth. All right, so now then we can go on into verse 21. These kind of people who have had enough understanding of the truth that they can use it to <coughs> enhance their own false teaching. Verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now what's Peter saying? been better so far as their end judgment is concerned had they never had any knowledge of the truth at all. They've been better off to go into eternity as an ignorant pagan as to have had enough understanding to have embraced it and been saved by it and then turn around and reject it. Now, I think another example of this, and, and we taught this quite in depth when we were back in the Hebrews lessons, and that would be back in Hebrews chapter 6, where we have the same kind of a scenario as with this Simon. Only Simon was a little more, I suppose, to the extreme. He was a false teacher and a follower of satanic magicians and so forth. <clears throat> Whereas these Hebrew people that are addressed here were just simply Judaizers who had been steeped in Judaism and the Mosaic law. And they saw a little bit of Paul's gospel of grace by faith plus nothing. <clears throat> but <clears throat> they in turn turned away from that and went back into Judaism. Well, it's just like Peter will say in the next verse. All right, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. See, we're talking about the same thing. They've had enough understanding, they could have latched on to it. And they've tasted of the heavenly gift. 
And they were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had done His work. And they have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the world to come. My, they got a good view of everything. Now, if they shall fall away. And remember when we studied this, the Greek word was parapipto, if I remember correctly. And parapipto was a Greek word that actually in, uh, uh, it gave the idea of a woman who scornfully turned from her husband to go into adultery. And that's what these people are doing. They've seen enough of the truth. They could have embraced it. They could have had it. But they scornfully turned around and rejected it and went back into their Judaism. And that's why Paul then uses these words in verse 6, still in Hebrew 6, that if they shall fall away, if they shall scornfully reject all this and renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame, and so forth, by their rejection. All right, now Peter puts it in a little different language, but it's the same setting. Only now, instead of talking about good mainline Judaizering Jews, now he's talking about Jews who are false teachers. And I'm sure he's talking about Jews. Jews who are false teachers. All right, now verse 22. But it has happened unto them. These false teachers who had enough knowledge, they could have gone on into the truth and latched on to it, but instead used it for merchandise, used it to enhance their own monetary situation. All right, it has happened to them according to the true proverb. And that comes out of the Old Testament economy now. The dog is turned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. In other words, unless you can actually change the nature of these creatures, they're still going to go back to their old way. And it's the same way with the person who partakes of a false salvation. They can make a verbal commitment. They can make an outward profession. But until it comes down into the heart and transforms their nature, they're going to go right back into their old lifestyle. And we see it over and over and over. But for the person who is truly born from above, he's truly had a salvation experience, He's not going to be like the hog that has just been cleaned up and goes back to his old mud hole. No, they're going to turn their back on the old life and they're going to start growing in the new. And Peter uses the same kind of an example as Paul would use in his writings to us. All right, so there's the problem. These people em embrace enough to make it merchandisable, something they can make money from, but they've never had a true change in their own nature, and so they're just like the hog that goes back to his wallowing in the mire. All right, false teachers, something that we all have to be aware of. In fact, before I leave this chapter, I want to keep, I'm being reminded all the time, to come back to Matthew 24, where the Lord himself is warning. Matthew 24. For the Lord himself warns against the false teachers that would be coming in the last days. And of course we know that we're approaching them. We're positive that we're approaching the last days that the Lord is referring to in Matthew 24. <clears throat> Drop in, honey, at verse 4. Matthew 24, verse 4. And this is from the lips of the Lord himself. Verse 4, Jesus answered, that is, to the twelve, as they were asking the questions. He answered and said, now just watch this carefully. Take heed, or Paul would say, beware, that no man, what? Deceive you. What's the warning? Don't be deceived. Don't be taken in by false teachers. And then here's the reason, verse 5. For many shall come in my name. They're going to make no apology for talking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll drop that name glibly. That's part and parcel of their makeup. 
All right, but the Lord reminds us, for many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And by it, they're going to what? Deceive many. And we're seeing it. My, when you see all these vast crowds come rolling into these places, oh, I'm sure the Lord's going to save some of them, hopefully. But don't you believe for a minute that these vast crowds are all experiencing a true born from above experience. Or hey, we wouldn't have the problems in the world that we've got. It would have an impact on the community, but it doesn't. It doesn't change a bit. All right, and so the whole warning is don't be taken in by all these who can use the name of the Lord Jesus and seemingly preach the gospel and yet with it bring in, as Paul calls them, their damnable heresies. Hey, there's our sign to beware that this is maybe not the truth that they claim it is. All right, come back with me to 2 Peter now. We're ready for chapter 3. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, and I haven't reminded you enough today. Remember that Peter is writing to Jewish believers of the kingdom economy. There's nothing of Paul's gospel in here. You can't find a single reference of salvation by faith and faith alone in Christ's finished work of the cross. Oh, he certainly makes allude, uh, alludes to that Christ is Savior and all that. But it's not a presentation of the Pauline gospel that Christ died for the sins of the world and that he was buried and he arose again the third day. It's just not in here. Because this is still Jews who had been under that kingdom economy. When I say the kingdom economy, remember, it's they were to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah and King. That's what they were to believe. And when they believed it, they became believers, and they became members of the Jerusalem church. But it was a Jewish church. There are no Gentiles involved whatsoever. All right, and those are the offshoots then from the Jerusalem church that scattered because of Saul of Tarsus' persecution, and they established other little congregations around that end of the Mediterranean, up along the Galilee. But these churches, I think, were predominantly operating in Western Asia Minor, or Turkey, as we now know it today. And those are the same seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation, all over in what we know of as Western Turkey. All right, so remember that these are the Jews to whom Peter is writing. And you remember when we introduced the book of James, they know nothing of Paul's breaking open of the timeline for 2,000 years. Everything is going to come down the line as it was prophesied in the Old Testament and as Jesus and Peter had continued it. And they look for everything to be fulfilled within their lifetime. Matter of 20, 30 years. And Christ would uh, usher in the tribulation. That would bring his second coming. He could bring in the kingdom. And all of these Jews were looking forward to that. And so Second Peter, just like First Peter, is preparing these people for the pressures that they would be coming under because of their faith in the promises of the prophetic scriptures. And that's why he's always going back to the Old Testament. You never see anything from Paul here in Peter. Peter isn't quoting Paul until he tells us to go to Paul in the last verse or so. But always be aware of this, that Peter and James and John are writing to these Jewish believers in view of the fact that the Old Testament prophecies are just going to keep unfolding. All right, you'll see it as we come along. Verse 1, this second epistle, probably written about ten years after the first. Beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, in other words, the true believers that he's referring to, by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words, now watch this, highlight it, do something, because this fits what I just said that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy, who? Prophets. Who were the prophets? Well, your Old Testament writers. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Hosea, the whole bit. And what did all the Old Testament prophets foresee? The coming of Israel's Messiah and King, 
and then the tribulation, of course he'd be rejected and go back to heaven, and then the tribulation and then their Messiah would return and set up the kingdom. And they were looking for that. Okay, so this is why the constant reminder is, go back to the promises of the Holy Prophet. Now, let's show you what Paul says. And now, verse you probably, some of you who are with me all the time, you're going to say, oh no, not again. Yeah, again. Romans 15, verse 8. Romans 15, verse 8. We've read it off now. Some of you should just know it from memory now. Romans 15, verse 8. And this fits right along with what Peter is saying that everything written by the prophets is now right out in front of them. Romans 15, verse 8. Okay? Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, Israel, for the truth of God. And here's why he came to confirm or fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Well, who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Moses, and then the prophets. And Christ came to fulfill all those promises, see? And what were the promises? The king and the kingdom. That was basically what they were looking for, the glories of the kingdom. My, who wouldn't? Heaven on earth? That should excite anybody. And so that was the hope of Israel. And it still is for a Jew that has any knowledge at all. What's his daily prayer? Next year, Jerusalem. Next year, Jerusalem. And the Jews have been uttering that for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then the ignoramuses of the world tell us that the Jews have no business there. They've been looking forward to their homeland for 2,000 years. Next year, Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where the king will come. That's where the heaven on earth will originate. And so all of the prophets were looking forward to that. All right, back to 2 Peter. And so he is in line with that. That you may be mindful, verse 2 again, that you may be mindful, that you might be aware of the words which were spoken before, by the holy prophets, the Old Testament writers. And, of course, that just carried on through into Christ's earthly ministry, the commandment of us, the apostles, and the Lord and Savior. They were all working on that same timeline, coming out of the prophetic scriptures, the coming of the Messiah, rejected, crucified, Raised from the dead, and Peter proclaims that in Acts chapter 2. You killed him, but God raised him from the dead. He can still fulfill the promises. And he went back to glory, and he's going to sit at the Father's right hand. And what's the next word in Psalms 110? Until. Until. And then he'll arise from that seated position, and he's yet going to fulfill the promises made to Israel. And we're getting closer every day. That's why the whole Middle East is in a turmoil. My, I can't figure out why people can't see it. Why isn't all this turmoil over in the Orient someplace? Why isn't it over in Western Europe? Why is it in the Middle East? Because at the core of it all is Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. Okay, next verse. Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, false teachers again, walking after their own what? Lusts. Well, what in the world is our lust? Desires. And it doesn't have to be sexual. My goodness, you can lust for money. You can lust for palaces and houses and land. See? And that's what people do when they start getting money. The more they get, the more they want. You always have to remember, be mindful, the old Texas rancher, somebody asked him, they said, when in the world are you going to stop buying land? Well, he says, when I've got everything around me. Well, that never stops. See? Every time you buy another half section, there's another half section on the other side that's still there. And so if you're just going to buy until you've got everything that's next to you, that never ends. 
And that is the lustful makeup then of the scoffers and false teachers. And Peter is warning his people, hey, this is a sign of the last days. Now, I think I put it on the board quite some time ago, and I think it bears putting it up here again. Which chalk have you been using, Jerry? Oh, this one? Okay, here we go. From the time of Christ's first advent, his three years of ministry, and his ascension, and then was to come the seven years of tribulation, Christ would return, set up the thousand-year kingdom, it would end, and then we'd go into eternity. Now you see, this whole ball of wax, from Christ's first advent to the ushering in of eternity, in Scripture is called what? The last days. The last days. All of this was to be consummated to bring the world to the place where we go into eternity. Now, you've got to remember that had it not been for the 2,000 years of the church age, all of this, his first advent and then the seven years of tribulation, that would have been only a matter of 15 years or so. But when you throw in the thousand year of kingdom, of course, now we're talking about more time. But nevertheless, when you look at all the scripture, the thousand year reign of Christ is associated with these prophecies that are all called the last days. Now when you look at it in that light, maybe it makes a little more sense when we talk about in these last days. All right, come back to chapter 3. So Peter says that in these last days, as they're approaching now the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom, one of the signs that they were in the last days was the appearance of scoffers. Well, they had them then, but that doesn't cancel it out because we've got them now. Yeah, I told a lady here a while back, and I, I think it was so apropos, I've shared it with quite a few individuals. They were visiting us, and we were sitting at our kitchen table, and she was talking about an experience that she had had years back. And uh, just sort of a bizarre experience, a great white light filled her room or something like that, and she had always just assumed that that was Jesus and that was her salvation. But after she got watching our program a while and understood the gospel of grace, she became truly saved. So she's sharing this with me. So she said, now Les, you know, this bothers me. All those years I was thinking that that bright light experience had saved me. She said, it didn't. I was lost. I said, so what? The important thing is you're saved now. You get me? So regardless of what the past may be, whether you've been misled or whether you've missed the mark, if you're a believer today, that's what counts. Are you saved now? Forget about what you may have believed in the past. Okay, now Peter is more or less saying the same thing, see? That this we got to understand, that all of the signs of the soon coming of the tribulation and the Messiah of Israel were right in front of them. They were seeing it then. But don't chuck that aside and say, well, that's all past. Because here we are 2,000 years later and the whole scenario is back on the scene. Remember I pointed this out several, several tapings back? That just as surely as we had the Roman Empire and Israel in the land, as all these prophecies were ready to be fulfilled, here we are 2,000 years later and once again, Israel is back in the land, the Roman Empire is reappearing in the common market and in the area of that, and so everything is now reset. That's a good word, reset. It's reset, ready to go again, see? All right, now keep that in mind then, that as Peter is proclaiming this to his Jewish believers in preparation for the end and the last days, even though we've had a 2,000 year interval, we are once again in the same place. Israel is back in the land. Roman Empire is reappearing. The scoffers are coming in like never before in human history. Everything is reset. Deja vu, is that the word they use? Yeah. Okay, verse 4. 
And these scoffers will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the Father... See, now these are Jews. You can tell that. These are Jews that are saying this because who was constantly referring to the fathers? Well, Jews were. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the fathers of Israel. And so this is what they're saying. The scoffers are saying. Why, ever since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we've been hearing this stuff. It's never going to happen. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Well, what are they ignoring? Things aren't always the same as they were from the creation. There's one great big upheaval that intervened between creation and even when Peter is writing. And what was it? Noah's flood. See, Noah's flood totally revamped the whole earth. And so he goes on into that. That's the next subject, see? All right. The scoffers say all things continue as they were from the creation. Nothing has ever changed. Oh, ho, Peter says. Wait a minute. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Now I've got to stop. I like that term. Willingly ignorant. Don't you like that? Yeah, because that's most people. They don't want to know the truth. They just simply say, I don't want to hear it. What is that? Willingly ignorant. They could know if they'd look. My, we get phone call after phone call. Well, they'll so show some of these things to individuals that should be able to say, well, just let me study this for a while. This is totally new to me. Give me some time and let me, let me just study and uh, then I'll see if I can agree with you or not. But they won't. They just simply slam the book shut and they said, I don't believe that. I won't have anything to do with that. Well, what are they? Willingly ignorant. All right, now in this case, of course, Peter is talking about Noah's flood. They are willingly ignorant. That by the word of God, God in his sovereignty brought judgment upon that generation of people so that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And they're willingly ignorant. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldman.